Who's you? Kinemagi and Nene Errol and Indigenicus, and welcome to this production of Social Studies Explorer. Today's episode, Chapter 4, Section 7, Food, Clothing, and Shelter. Today we'll be looking at the Michigan Open Book, Section 7, Food, Clothing, and Shelter. We see some key vocabulary, maize, another word for corn, preserve, which was the idea of making sure our food didn't spoil right away so we could eat it later, particularly if you live in a northern climate where you needed to go all winter long, and fasting, which is when you choose not to eat during certain parts or entire days for a religious or cultural reason. So let's begin with food today. The colonists had brought some plants and animals with them from England to get started, like cattle, pigs, sheep, and chickens. By the time the colonies were up and running, they had also developed a varied and sufficient diet. After arriving, the colonists also added several kinds of fish, wild game, and new plants to their diet. Many of these new foods were sent back to England for trade. Some of the new plants that were sent include tomatoes, potatoes, maize, and pumpkins. One big problem the colonists had with food was the lack of refrigeration. This meant that food had to be eaten as soon as it became available. Certain crops were only available in certain seasons, and hunting was difficult in the winter. Meat was that was ready had to be used immediately. Imagine trying to eat a whole cow in one sitting. The real problem came during winter. Since there was not a great way to set food aside, the winter months were often difficult for the colonists. And this is true in any group of people when you don't have refrigeration, is you need to find a way to preserve the food. Whether we're talking about the Anishinaabeg in the Great Lakes or in the Northeast, or the colonists who had emigrated from England here to the United, what's now the United States. As time went on, the colonists discovered several ways to preserve their food more efficiently. One of the most common methods of meat preservation was salting. Since it was difficult economically to feed animals in the winter, the colonists would slaughter several animals in the autumn and then salt them for the winter months. Some other common forms of food preservation were smoking, pickling, and making pre preserves like jam and jelly. I'm not sure how much we really discovered in this instance, as we did read the section on trading gold for salt. We knew that salt was already a, a preservative and it would have been a preservative also used in Europe and pretty much anywhere else on the planet. But these are some common things that they did use. The colonists tried to eat three meals a day when food was available and religious traditions did not require fasting. In fact, it is believed that the colonists did not eat about half of the days of the year between abstaining from eating and fasting for religious reasons. On the days the colonists did eat, their meal times would likely be similar to what you do now but portions were smaller because it was considered sinful to overeat. Some common meals for the colonists were stews, breads, puddings, and, banana and pancakes. They also learned, ab ab about, they also learned about to make several desserts, including pies. Clothing. In England, the clothing people wore was very fancy during the colonial era. It was made from expensive cloth like velvet or satin and would have been decorated with lace or buttons. The colonists, however, did not approve of, these, of those styles and many thought everything should be plain, very plain. The dress of the English reminded them of the rules and beliefs that they came to the new world to avoid. On top of that, the colonists had to make their own clothes. So, clothing was designed for warmth, sturdiness, and ease. Most of the clothing was made from wool, 
leather, or linen. Men's clothing was very plain. They would wear loose linen shirts and pants that went to their knees. The rest of their legs would be covered in long wool stockings. On top of their shirts, they would add a sleeveless jacket. In the cold of winter, they may have traded this piece out for padded jacket with sleeves. They also wore leather shoes and a wide brimmed hat for protection from the sun. And you can see an example of this in the image here. Women's clothing came in many layers. They would first put on a long loose dress. On top of that, they added a long dress made of linen or wool, depending on the season. Finally, they added an apron to, top, to the top of the outfit. Everything they wore was held in place by tying it there. There were no zippers and few buttons. They would pull their hair up into a coif or close fitting fabric hat. They also wore long wool stockings and shoes made of thick leather. If the weather was poor, they also added a coat or cape to the ensemble. After the age of seven, colonial children wore clothing very similar to their parents. Before that time, they wore a large gown called a shift. This was true for both boys and girls. This boat is tied in the back so the strings could be used to help guide children learning to walk or to restrain poorly behaved children. Hmm, interesting idea. Some toddlers were also wore padded caps to prevent injury if they fell. Some colonists were also fortunate enough to have servants. Servants also had a particular type of dress in the American colonies. While colonists tended to wear white, black, and brown, servants normally wore blue. This made it easier to distinguish between servants and colonists. Well, how nice of them. Um, there is a interactive here, children's clothing, and I clicked on it for you. And apparently it wants me to see an ad. So let's see if we can avoid the ad by hitting refresh. You can see some of the brighter colored ones here tied in the back. Another of the dress. More of the dress. Colonial homes varied with the materials available in each area. The original settlers tended to build log cabin style homes. This was mainly due to the fact that they had a large amount of timber available to them. As time went on, different home styles started to show up. The types of homes built varied with location, materials available, and wealth. In New England, homes were typically built as townhouses or row houses. They also had colonial style homes that were a symmetrical design with the fireplace in every room. People in the middle colonies usually lived in farmhouses. One or two stories tall with four bedrooms. The South is famous for their plantation manners. While most Southern colonists did not live on a plantation, they were by far the most recognizable style of home there. Plantations were very extravagant and showed great wealth. That is the conclusion of the reading of chapter four, section seven. At this point, you should return to the Google Classroom to complete the assignment. Have a minute, you got it, and bye-bye,